Cassandra is both the canon main character of Assassin's Creed Odyssey and commonly considered to be the better protagonist over her brother Alexios. And I get why. Cassandra's voice actress, Melisanthi Mahout, turns in an excellent performance. She gives Cassandra a consistent sincerity that can ground the generally goofy script. Which is exactly why she isn't the best fit for Odyssey. Cassandra and Alexios may share the same lines of dialogue, but their two voice actors turn in such different performances that they don't feel even close to being the same character. Did he say Cyclops? Did he hurt your feelings? Did he say Cyclops? Did it hurt your feelings? Michael Antonakis really knows when to ham it up as Alexios, channeling the Minotaur to force performances you'd find in prestige films like Jason and the Argonauts. That isn't to say he derails serious moments, though. Just that Odyssey's script frequently serves up a ham roast and he's starving for a full course meal, so Alexios ends up coming across as more animated and lively than Cassandra. To be entirely honest, Melisanti's remarkable performance is a better fit for a game like Assassin's Creed Origins, a dark drama. But even though Odyssey tries to be a drama at times, to say that its tone is inconsistent would be like saying I'm 10 feet tall. A gross understatement. Since Odyssey came out, I've been trying to enjoy it, to the point where I did two near joyless playthroughs of it as Cassandra. I started out doing the same thing for this video when I decided to play as Alexios for a bit, just for the sake of being thorough. Experiencing Odyssey as Alexios was a revelation, like seeing the face of God after two years and three playthroughs. I finally kind of had fun with Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Even though I enjoyed my most recent playthrough of AC Odyssey, there were still a number of issues to overcome. None more prevalent, however, than the main story, which is unfortunate because it's a substantial part of the experience, and as such, its faults need to be discussed, especially when they run so deep. The characters are awful, the themes are worse, and though I don't care much about the construction of a story's plot, Odyssey's is also borderline incoherent. However. Before delving in, I want to make it clear that this is not a condemnation of the developers and writers. From experience, I know that writing any story is difficult, and writing a good one even more so. Game writers have it even worse because, at a big studio like Ubisoft, having to write with multiple people is guaranteed, so then it becomes a group effort where several different writers have to work together, keep their writing styles consistent, and on top of that, the stories they write have to fit within the constraints of the gameplay, setting, budget, and more. It also isn't unheard of for the basic story premise to be dictated by higher-ups who don't actually have to write the damn thing. So even though I thoroughly dislike Odyssey's story, I wasn't involved in developing the game and I have no idea what the developers went through getting it to the finish line. And in fact, more than just regular development issues, the developers at Ubisoft Quebec who worked on Odyssey also had to contend with Ubisoft's systemic culture of abuse. In particular, Odyssey's creative director has been accused of verbal abuse, physical intimidation, using homophobic slurs, and specifically targeting women. And, in addition to developing Odyssey in a workplace dominated by fear and abuse, the developers also had their own suffering actively covered up by Ubisoft. Currently, I have the good fortune to have never endured something so awful, so regardless of whatever else I have to say, the fact that the developers at Ubisoft managed to create a game of the size and scale of Odyssey under such abusive working conditions and management is a miracle and a testament to their incredible talent and passion. 
in light of the context under which Odyssey was created, it feels almost crass to criticize it. I can only hope that what I have to say will be taken in good faith as a sign of respect to the developers by evaluating the art they have created seriously and to the best of my ability. The main theme of Assassin's Creed Odyssey is family. It's not a particularly interesting theme, but it isn't an inherently bad one either. The issue lies with Odyssey's extremely limited conception of what a family is. Even though the story takes place during the Peloponnesian War, it struggles to imagine a family beyond the confines of the nuclear family unit, or in other words, a family composed of a mother, father, and children. The most aggravating part of its refusal to explore other types of family is that it starts out with a decent setup for exploring found family. After Alexios and his sister are thrown off Mount Taietos, presumably to their deaths, Alexios escapes from Sparta and winds up on the island of Catalonia, where he is taken in and cared for by the affable conman Marcos. Some years later, Marcos also takes in an orphan named Phoebe who acts like a little sister to Alexios. So even though Odyssey starts with Alexios having found other family members, Marcos and Phoebe are never properly considered to be his real family. One of the most unintentionally hilarious scenes in Odyssey is in the introduction, where, after Alexios rescues Phoebe, she tells him earnestly that he and Marcos are her family and that they are also his family too. The moment the word family gets used, Odyssey immediately shows a flashback of Alexios's Spartan family, his real family. When the story returns to the present, Alexios mutters a hollow, Right. Even if Odyssey isn't trying to say that Phoebe and Marcos aren't Alexios's true family, the fact that he starts daydreaming about the family he was born into while Phoebe is telling him he's her family still communicates that sentiment anyway. At the very least, it gives the impression that Alexios doesn't consider them to be his true family. If Odyssey was using this scene to lay down the groundwork for a character arc where Alexios gradually realizes Phoebe and Marcos are just as much his family as the one he was born into, it would be one thing. But I think the scene is meant to be taken at face value because none of the endings feature anyone outside of Alexios' most immediate family members. In what is meant to be the good ending, Alexios has dinner with his mother, stepfather, stepdumbass, and sister. If none of those characters are alive by the end of the game, perhaps due to some… questionable choices that were made throughout the game, then Alexios, or in the case of my previous playthrough, Cassandra, will sit at the table by herself. What's even more frustrating is that past the introduction, Odyssey gives itself an even better setup for exploring broader concepts of family. Once the introduction ends, Alexios ditches Cephalonia and embarks on a quest to track down his mother. Since his quest takes him all across the Greek world, he could encounter different types of family through Odyssey's many side quests or the main story. He also has his own ship, the Adrestia, which he uses to sail around Greece and he gets the opportunity to recruit new people to serve as his ship lieutenants. Unfortunately, the primary purpose of the Adrestia's crew is to be an extension of player expression and power progression, rather than narrative exploration, so regardless of who your lieutenants are, they all have their personalities stripped away to better serve as passive stat bonuses and extra soldiers for ship combat. This even extends to Alexios' family members the ones you spend the whole game trying to reunite with. Whichever family members survive the main story are given to you at the end of the game as legendary ship lieutenants. From there, they are given a scant few lines of dialogue before forever being relegated to stat bonuses with unique character models. I understand that it would be a tremendous amount of work to write dialogue for ship crew members, especially enough for a game the size of Odyssey, but assembling your own found family aboard the Adrestia would be both a narratively and mechanically compelling way to explore Odyssey's central theme. Also, giving you Alexios' family members as a reward only serves to further highlight how little Odyssey even cares for them as characters. Rather than offering any kind of substantial closure for them, it prioritizes rewarding the player over any kind of responsibility to the narrative. And since Odyssey is the kind of game that's willing to turn its main characters into passive stat bonuses, it goes without saying their characterizations suffer. None more so, however, than Marini, Alexios's mother. 
For the first two-thirds of Odyssey's story, finding her is the main goal, so she is one of, if not the, most important character. And unfortunately, she is hands down the most unlikable. Marini's characterization is best described as sloppy. When she's first introduced, she's ruling over the island of Naxos and has just entered into a reluctant alliance with Sparta. After she watched Sparta throw both of her children to what she thought was their deaths, she wanted nothing to do with it. However, once Alexios reunites with her, she suddenly decides that she actually really does like the taste of Spartan boot leather because she dedicates herself entirely to aiding Sparta. Right after her introduction on Naxos, she and Alexios return to Sparta. As the two of them are riding through Laconia, they come across two young boys being mauled to death by wolves. Alexios, who has a conscience, is about to assist them when his mother stops him because the area is Spartan training territory. Odyssey then presents a choice to help them, which I did, and afterwards Marini chastised me because my actions made the Spartan army weaker. It is genuinely baffling that as soon as she sets foot back on Sparta, she is defending the cruel laws that were directly used against her own children. Marini is meant to be a character of her time. She is a born and bred Spartan and the daughter of Leonidas, so it makes sense that she would have Spartan sympathies and values if not for the fact that she hasn't lived in Sparta for 20 plus years and left because Sparta threw both of her children straight off a cliff. Real people hold conflicting beliefs all the time, so Marini is allowed to as well. But for those beliefs to clash directly with her own personal trauma, and then for that to go completely unexamined, makes it come across less as a character choice and more as sloppy writing. Honestly, I think the scene's primary purpose is to serve as exposition for Sparta more than anything else, which is supported by the conversation Marini and Alexios have right after, where she exposits more information. However, there's no reason why the exposition had to be included at the cost of Marini's character. The scene could have had her decide to help, which would remove the choice from the player, but that's an easy sacrifice to make for the sake of Marini's character. The exposition would also stay because a mean Spartan shows up out of the blue to mule at Alexios about how bad he is for saving children from being violently murdered because it means the Spartan military will be less efficient at violent murder. All Marini does now is immediately take a side against her own long lost son almost as soon as she's met him to bootlick for the people that tried to kill him. And this is to say nothing of the fact that Marini is one of the most important characters in Odyssey's narrative, so she, out of everyone, should have one of the most carefully crafted characterizations instead of being thrown to the wolves for the sake of some exposition. To be honest, I could continue to complain like this about almost every part of Odyssey's main story, but I think I've made my point. There's no reason to go over every inch of it with a fine tooth comb just so I can take a hammer to its knees. Instead, I want to talk about the final strike against Odyssey's narrative, which is its fetish for bloodlines. I think one of the worst possible directions to take the theme of family would be to the conclusion that your bloodline is not only important, but makes you better than other people. So, naturally, Alexios' entire place in the world is determined by his bloodline. He and his sister Cassandra are, for all intents and purposes, demigods. In AC lore, there is a precursor race called the Isu who are responsible for all of the franchise's science fiction shenanigans, so Alexios and Cassandra are descendants of them, which is by design because their mother specifically hooked up with another Isu descendant for the express purpose of continuing their all-important bloodline. Again, this is the kind of setup that isn't inherently bad if Odyssey was at least slightly critical of it. But it isn't. It's played straight. Alexios is destined for greatness because of the blood that runs in his veins, something his mother tells him as a child. In fact, Alexios' bloodline is so important that there is a group dedicated to wiping out him and his family called the Cult of Cosmos. Well, actually, what the cult really wants is to capture Alexios and his family and force them to produce errors so that they can control the world because that's how powerful their bloodline is. I hope I don't have to spell out why presenting Alexios and his family is important because of their superior bloodline is bad, but just in case I do, historically this kind of thinking has led to fun things like feudalism and eugenics. Now, to be clear, Odyssey is absolutely not arguing for either of those things. It's mostly just using the trite, special family trope you see in something like Star Wars, so it's problematic in similar ways, just not necessarily malicious. 
Frankly, even though Alexios' all-important bloodline is repeatedly brought up, Odyssey doesn't really do anything with it. It never explains why his blood is important outside of the fact that it gives him literal superpowers. So whatever it says, it says by virtue of not exploring the issue past the basic premise, which I suppose means you could think I'm giving it an uncharitable reading. Here is the thing. I don't trust you. Regardless, I'd consider Odyssey's lack of exploration into bloodlines when they are presented so prominently as a flaw. There are also parts of Odyssey that promote other poisonous messages, like the idea that you owe family members love and forgiveness no matter what, which it applies to Nikolaos, Alexios' Spartan father, and the man who threw him off Mount Taietos, or the way it tries to present Greek slavery as a morally gray issue, and while Greek slavery is different from chattel slavery, being forced to put down a slave rebellion in the main story as a checklisting quest for Sparta is still in poor taste. There are others too, but at this point it's starting to feel like the horse has been dead for a long time, and I've been beating it for even longer. Shut the fuck up! Even though the main story is an important part of the experience, Odyssey has a lot more to offer than just that. Because I knew I didn't like the main story, I instead looked to its side content for narrative satisfaction, and since this was my third playthrough, I also knew to avoid certain side quests that I don't like. Again, my objective was to enjoy Odyssey to the best of my ability, and this approach to engaging with its narrative content helped me do just that. In particular, the Lost Tales of Greece added in post-launch are genuinely great, a real cut above the rest of Odyssey's storytelling. A lot of them lean into its comedic side and had me consistently laughing throughout their entire duration, such as the questline that has Alexios assisting a village that recently fell victim to a grifter impersonating him. The tasks you're given blend in with the kind of objectives you complete in the rest of the game, but the writing elevates all of it because the isolated nature of the questline allows Alexios to become a cursed eldritch abomination enveloped in a passive aura of death and misfortune like Cthulhu or Mr. Bean. Helping out the local blacksmith results in him tripping over the stones you set down for him, and then getting bludgeoned to death by all of his equipment. After you recover a stolen horse for the stable master, she rides it straight off a cliff because the imposter Alexios told her the horse could fly. <laughs> On my way to the next quest, I passed a bear on the road, and since I didn't want to bother getting off my horse and killing it, I rode past it. Well, once I had started the quest, Alexios's aura of death rubbed off on me, because I failed the quest when the central character got mauled to death by that same bear. And then, after I loaded the save and killed the bear ahead of time, the quest ended with me burning the man alive because the imposter Alexios told him his helmet would make him immortal. By the time Alexios gets done helping the town, he's done far more damage than the dollar store Alexios ever could. This could not have gone worse. The absurd series of quests then culminates in an equally absurd encounter with the imposter Alexios, who you can sleep with and recruit to become one of your ship lieutenants because Odyssey is really horny, which I don't want to talk about right now, or really ever, but I guess I should. Throughout Odyssey's main and side quests, there are a number of romances Alexios can engage with. These are more accurately described as mostly optional one-night stands with conventionally attractive characters. A lot of games do this, and at least Odyssey doesn't expose you to the horror of two mannequins awkwardly rubbing up against each other, but the implementation of romances looks bad when compared to Origins, where sex was used to communicate the decline of Bayek and I's relationship. The romances in Odyssey feel more like a marketing feature than they do a meaningful addition to the narrative content, something I think is reinforced by how many of the Lost Tales of Greece include obligatory romance options, to the degree that it almost comes across as desperate once you notice it. Really though, outside of one notable exception I'll talk about later, the romances are an inoffensive inclusion that aren't especially good or bad, they simply exist. Tacked on romances aside, the Lost Tales of Greece are excellent. I think what really sets them apart from the rest of the game is the way they lean into being a series of self-contained, sometimes comical adventures for Lexios to bumble through. They aren't all strictly comedic though. There is a series of quests that's just the Seven Samurai but in ancient Greece, and another where you meet up with an old friend of Alexios and you either respect her request to teach her son farm work, or disrespect her by teaching her son murder is badass. No matter the tone of the quest chains, however, 
All of them are multi-stage stories that let you get familiar with a small area, a handful of characters, and their problems. Most of the other side quests in Odyssey are one stage, one off affairs where you meet a character, they tell you their woes, and then you go off and put those woes in the ground. So while the Lost Tales are good on their own, viewed in the context of Odyssey as a greater whole, they are a genuine highlight of the experience. While the Lost Tales of Greece make up the majority of Odyssey's standout side content, there are some other really entertaining side quests scattered throughout the game as well. Wait, so the thief and the blacksmith are Supidio's birth parents. You killed his mother and fucked his pater. But the prophecy said pater would scream to the gods in agony. He screamed, but not in agony. Some are quest chains, some are one-off quests, but for the most part, the best are the ones that embrace a lighter tone or run with some kind of absurd idea, like crafting a love potion or a series of quests where Lexios helps out Socrates, who destroys him in the marketplace of ideas by springing gotchas on him. Interestingly enough, Socrates also has his arc resolved in a lost tale of Greece. I've known you for a while now. That's true. And you'd call us friends? I would. And friends share important things with one another. Is that so? It is. Then how did I not know you were married? However, it must be said that while Odyssey has a lot of great side quests, it also has a lot of boring ones. The less interesting quests tend to be narratively thin, with most of your time spent traveling between quest locations. There are also some quests that feel procedurally generated, where the game will spawn a quest giver who gives Alexios a very simple, single objective quest with even more threadbare narrative context. The backhanded compliment I can offer these quests is that they sometimes fit in with the other forgettable side quests that aren't procedurally generated. These quests are clearly drawing inspiration from Bethesda's Radiant quests in Fallout 4 and Skyrim, which I consider to be one of the absolute worst features Bethesda has ever committed to. But I digress. Odyssey's side quests are ultimately a mixed bag. Some are fairly forgettable, others are a lot of fun, but even the simple quests aren't inherently bad. In fact, I think they exist for a very specific reason, which is to give Odyssey some quick content that's easy to churn through when you're short on time. One of Odyssey's chief concerns across both the narrative and gameplay is being a power fantasy. The narrative feeds the power fantasy by having Alexios be born great and through its addition of narrative choices so that the player can feel like they are directly shaping the story. And the simple quests exist as a way to provide a constant feeling of progress. Regardless of how engaging the content is, completing any of it will meaningfully grow Alexios's power, either through XP gains, Drachne payouts, new gear, or more often than not, all three. So even though I don't like the bare bones side quests, they still serve their purpose well, and there are probably a lot of people who genuinely do like them because they can make even a short session with Odyssey feel like time well spent. Those quests are also a very good representation of the gameplay in general, since almost all of it is geared towards fueling the power fantasy of being a demigod hero. Odyssey is a very different game from AC Origins. One of the key differences between them is that Odyssey all ends up being a role-playing game, complete with a few different character builds and a variety of active skills. The character builds and active skills drastically impact Odyssey's gameplay experience to the degree that it barely feels related to Origins. Combat, for instance, no longer has a block function, it has instead been replaced with a parry that does an area of effect stun should you manage to hit the exceedingly generous timing window. Enemies now have clear visual tells for their parryable attacks too. This, along with the addition of an active skill that lets you heal, makes combat far more aggression oriented than combat in Origins, which was about careful and considered play. Much like... Hentai no Hero. There are also now a number of different combat-focused active skills that change it to be more about managing ability cooldowns and building up adrenaline, the resource required to use powers. The addition of active skills also has the knock-on effect of making Odyssey's skill tree much more compelling than Origins, since you're unlocking new skills to use in combat rather than boring stat boosts. Well, at least until you hit a certain threshold and unlock a staggering amount of stats you can level. 
But that's fine, because by that point you'll have unlocked all the skills you want and then some, so the stat boosts actually become more enticing than unlocking abilities you don't want. Odyssey's various abilities also allow for starker differences in playstyles. The different playstyles on offer are Hunter, Warrior, and Assassin. Hunter playstyles are all about using bow abilities, Warrior centers around melee abilities, and Assassin is focused on stealth. For my most recent playthrough, I used an Assassin build because one of the other major changes to combat is that enemies take a lot more damage than they did in Origins. In order to make all the different abilities useful, Odyssey makes them deal significantly more damage than your regular attacks, and to make the damage increase matter, it makes enemies take an eternity to kill. The reason why I focused on an Assassin build is because Assassin's skills have to deal astronomically higher amounts of damage than all the other skills because otherwise it would be impossible to kill enemies from stealth. So, I did my best to avoid combat whenever possible, and when I couldn't, my assassin strike ability was capable of one-shotting most enemies, including bosses. I'll carve you from the face of this world! <laughs> <laughs> Another change made to accommodate the inclusion of character builds is Odyssey's revamped loot system. In Origins, you only got new weapons and shields. Odyssey lets you get full armor sets too. However, the most meaningful change Odyssey makes is the addition of Hunter, Warrior, and Assassin damage modifiers on almost every piece of gear. I blew these off on my first two playthroughs because I had no interest in constantly micromanaging my gear, but at least for Assassin damage, the modifiers dramatically increased my ability to deal damage. This is because Odyssey doesn't slack off with the damage modifiers. One piece of gear can give you a flat 10% plus damage buff, and all of them stack. Because Assassin damage is so much higher by default, I only used gear that would give me significant damage gains, and that in turn changed the entire way I played Odyssey because it enabled me to slaughter my way through pretty much the whole game. If I hadn't decided to overhaul my playthrough to focus on stealth abilities, I don't think I would like the gear system. But as it stands, I am extremely grateful it exists and that Ubisoft attached such generous damage buffs to almost every item. However, this does come with the caveat that I was essentially using this system to minimize the amount of time I spent in combat because I don't enjoy it. Even though I thought the combat in Origins was a bit too shallow for its own good, I think the combat in Odyssey is even more shallow, which made my previous playthroughs miserable slogs because Odyssey is at least 30 hours longer than Origins. I've already brought up a few of my big complaints with the combat, like enemies' inflated health pools and the emphasis on babysitting cooldowns because abilities are the only attacks that deal appreciable damage. I might not mind these changes as much if it wasn't for how shallow almost all of the combat abilities are. The best abilities, like Assassin Strike and Overpower Attacks, deal significant amounts of damage, but plenty of other skills like Ring of Chaos, Venomous Attacks, and Flaming Attacks are borderline useless. Or, generously, situationally useful. Because enemies take so many hits to kill, more often than not it feels like you're beating them to death with a wet noodle. Active skills all unleash significantly more damage than your regular attacks, but then that comes with the issue that most of them are fairly uninvolved. For instance, Assassin Strike deals massive amounts of damage, and all it takes for me to use is pressing its assigned hotkey. Then all I'm doing is watching the kill animation play. Same thing with Overpower Attacks and Fury of the Bloodline. Because so many of the most powerful skills require no involvement past pressing their hotkeys, late game combat encounters often felt more like I was watching the lengthy ability animations play out rather than actually playing the game myself. Even though I found Origins combat to be a touch too shallow, at least late game encounters still required me to pay attention. And unfortunately, the issues with Odyssey's gameplay don't end with the combat, in retrospect, I feel I might have been too harsh on Origins Stealth, because it did include a variety of different tools you can use, even though I never did. Odyssey doesn't have any stealth tools. Instead, it replaces them with active skills. But the problem is that stealth abilities are about as shallow as the combat abilities. Rush Assassinate is pretty much broken, because when you upgrade it to the max level, you can kill up to four enemies as long as they're all within sight of each other. 
If you get caught, there's an ability that blinds everyone who sees it, and from there you can go hide for a few seconds before using Rush Assassinate again. As far as stealth encounters are concerned, there were only a handful of them across my 100 hour playthrough where these tactics didn't work, and that was only because the quest giver told me not to get caught. So, with that in mind, let's say you want to play with the self-imposed challenge of staying undetected as you sneak through areas. Well, then stealth becomes a tedious affair of watching enemy patrol patterns and picking them off one by one in the safest possible manner. There's basically nothing you can do from stealth outside of assassinating one enemy at a time, or killing four with Rush Assassinate. Technically, you can also pick them off with bow abilities, but because Odyssey separates hunter damage from the rest, if you haven't committed to a gear set that does heavy hunter damage, you will rarely deal enough damage to kill enemies with a bow from stealth. If you do commit to a hunter playstyle, then you likely have the opposite issue, where you can only kill enemies with a bow because your assassin damage will be too low to take out most enemies from stealth. While I appreciate Odyssey's attempt to make each playstyle powerful if you commit to it, the end result is that you get pigeonholed into a specific playstyle with depth as deep as a puddle. The saving grace for Odyssey's gameplay, however, is that it all feels good. The animations, especially for stealth kills, are slick, and I genuinely never got tired of them. I think part of it is that I felt like I had broken the game with my assassin build, so trivializing boss fights and watching my damage numbers spike never got old, despite the repetition. Like some of the barebone side quests, however, the lack of depth in Odyssey's gameplay isn't inherently bad, because it also means it's an easy game to pick up and play. It doesn't require a lot from you mentally, so even though I don't like how shallow it is, for some people that makes Odyssey a lot more appealing. I will say though, since Odyssey is as long as listening to an audiobook of THE Odyssey eight times over, the lack of depth can be excruciating as the hours start to pile up. At least, it was for me. Even though Odyssey has a lot of issues with its storytelling and gameplay, I ultimately had a good time with it, and that is due in no small part to its DLC. One of my main issues with Assassin's Creed Origins was how it didn't experiment much with its expanded content, so it's fitting that one of the reasons I really like Odyssey is because its expanded content offers new experiences compared to those found within the base game. The Lost Tales of Greece are differentiated by the return to the episodic style of storytelling Origins often used, but the paid DLC for Odyssey shakes things up even more. The Legacy of the Hidden Blade DLC is a lot like the Lost Tales structurally because each of the three episodes takes place in areas of Greece that were almost untouched in the base game, and fleshes them out by making local issues an important part of the DLC's story. It's actually pretty fitting that since the DLC has the Order of Ancients serve as the main antagonist, the way the episodes are structured are in line with the way Origins structured itself. While the Legacy DLC has a lot in common with The Lost Tales, it's a lot longer too, and the story is deathly serious, so it's a good thing that the writing is a lot more entertaining than the main story in the base game. Along with a sharper script, the production values are also a good deal better than the rest of the game. The cinematography, for example, has a lot more variety compared to most of Odyssey, which even for the main story was mostly composed of shot-reverse shots of characters standing in place talking to each other. Complementing the increase in production values might seem like shallow praise, but it's worth remembering that only a fraction of the people who play Odyssey will ever touch the DLC, so its presentation having more work put into it shows a commitment from the developers to make it something special that's worthy of an additional investment of time in Drachmi. While I'm not entirely comfortable saying the storyline is actually good, I had a good time watching it unfold. Seeing Darius' backstory get slowly revealed throughout the first episode offers an interesting enough throughline to follow. The fact that he has a tangible history with the Order of Ancients gives his conflict with them a personal layer, which is then reflected through the respect he shows them after death, a minor but appreciated character touch. His daughter Nima also exists. However, I do want to talk about Alexios' encounter with the main antagonist of the DLC, the Huntsman, in a bit more depth. Halfway through the DLC, the Huntsman gathers together a group of people related to some of the many, many goons Alexios has stomped for the express purpose of guilt tripping him. This leads to a dialogue prompt where you decide if Alexios is a monster. 
I answered yes, because by that point in the game, I had killed at least a few thousand people. If you take that body count seriously, Alexios is undeniably a monster. But why would you? Odyssey almost never gives you a choice when it comes to killing people. It is not designed with non-lethal playstyles in mind, so it's genuinely puzzling that tens of hours into the experience it wants to paint Alexios as a morally ambiguous protagonist. However, this is not a one-off issue. Odyssey frequently tries to present morally gray scenarios, but more often than not, these issues aren't really all that gray if you stop to think about them. For example, one quest presents you with a choice to either destroy a shipment of poisoned goods before it reaches its destination, or kill the poisoner. It's an easy choice to make because one of them is guaranteed harm while the other is potential harm. One choice in the main story is to either kill the woman who tortured your sister, which Odyssey clarifies was when she was a baby. You tortured her? She was just a baby! I taught her to survive! This world is cruel! Or to save a different baby from being burned alive. Honestly, the choice was so insulting that I chose violence out of spite. Wanting to explore morally great issues is all well and good, but in order to do that effectively, there can't be such clear-cut right and wrong answers. Sometimes, Odyssey even includes consequences you can see play out after the quest ends that paints one choice as better than the other, like the quest where Alexios gathers up several materials for a young girl so that she can make presents for her friends. At the end of the quest, it's revealed that her friends are all made out of clay, so then you are presented with a choice to scream at her or to not do that. Odyssey paints the choice to scream at her as the best one because it leads to her making friends with other children, something you can see if you visit her place again after the quest has ended. The issue with this choice, outside of presenting the option to scream at the socially stunted child as the right one, They are not your friends! They are lumps of clay! <laughs> is that it's only morally gray because of how the choices are forced to be diametrically opposed. Letting her continue to literally make friends out of clay is only going to hurt her in the long run, but screaming at her to stop is obviously wrong. Most people would calmly explain to the child that she needs to make friends with other people, but Odyssey doesn't include that as an option so that the quest can have a forced moral dilemma. A lot of the side quests include choices like these at the end, which I think is Odyssey's attempt to mimic The Witcher 3, a game that was lauded for how it tackled morally complex issues. It's also a major source of inspiration for Odyssey. The difference between the way Witcher 3 handles moral choices and the way Odyssey does, however, is that The Witcher 3 has the patience to explore and flesh out the issues it's dealing with. For instance, there's a side quest where Geralt, the main character, gets hired to kill a monster out in the woods that's been ambushing military caravans. As Geralt's investigation progresses, he discovers the transports have been getting raided not by monsters, but by elven rebels. When he confronts the elves, they don't care about the soldiers they've killed and will continue to kill more of them and steal their supplies. This leads to a choice where Geralt can kill the elves or leave them be. While they have blood on their hands, they are killing to survive during wartime, and the elves are also quick to point out the soldiers have done a lot worse for a lot less. On the other hand, killing them might prevent further bloodshed, and their current way of life is unsustainable, so if Geralt doesn't finish them off, someone else will later down the line. This isn't even one of Witcher 3's memorable quests either. I selected it at random for the sake of fairness, and it's still a cut above the choices Odyssey presents, because the quest draws on Witcher's setting so that the complexity of the choice is understood by the time it arrives. You even get the quest from a soldier, who's guarding a bridge from refugees, and there's also the devastated aftermath of a battlefield close by, along with an optional encounter with some starving orphans on one of the roads that leads to the quest objective. There is real care put into reminding the player of the setting so that the choice makes sense, even if the player has an easy time deciding. Comparatively, the choices in Odyssey often feel thrown in at the last minute so that the player is more involved. There's a crystal clear example of this in the main story where Alexios goes off to collect a special bull's heart so that it can be used in a ritual to save a sick girl. When he comes back to deliver the heart, a man and a woman appear out of the ether asking Alexios to give them the heart. The man says he runs a farm that feeds the entire area, and the woman promises a substantial amount of drachmi. 
The choice is then transparently about choosing between saving the little girl as the moral choice, saving the man for the greater good, or saving the woman for self-interest. By comparison, the DLC guilt-tripping Alexios over his body count is at worst on par with the base game, so it isn't a damning flaw, but I thought it was the most interesting part of the DLC's first episode to discuss since the rest of it is otherwise pretty solid, though not especially good or bad. The second episode, Shadow Heritage, on the other hand, is my favorite out of the three because it does a good job building up to its climax and ends with a genuinely spectacular naval battle where you face off against overwhelming forces and carve through them with the newly added flamethrower. It's a real spectacle and redeemed the otherwise agonizingly simple ship combat. The epilogue to the DLC does come out of nowhere though, because Alexio settling down with Darius and the slab of cardboard he keeps carrying around is pretty strange. And the epilogue is also in an unfortunate situation, because depending on how far along you are in the game and what ending you got, it doesn't make any sense. For instance, it makes no sense that Alexios would start his own family before he's even finished his quest to reunite with his other family. On the other hand, if you do reunite his family, it makes no sense that they are never involved with and never meet his new family. The other issue is that if they did play a role in the DLC, it would need significant rewrites because the events of the third episode would have to unfold differently, if they even still could. Basically, there is only an extremely specific way the DLC, as it exists now, really makes any sense, which is that you got the bad ending so Alexios is the last surviving member of his family, and that also means you finish the main story in the base game. This isn't so much a complaint as it is something I think is interesting, because it highlights the unique challenges of crafting a narrative that is influenced by the player's decisions, along with the additional challenge of writing an entire other story arc that can be completed by players with varying levels of progress in the main story. What is a complaint, however, is that the Shadow Heritage DLC forces Alexios to settle down with Darius' daughter Nima. Because Odyssey is an RPG, and all the romances up to the Shadow Heritage DLC were optional, players were free to roleplay Alexios and Cassandra as gay or lesbian, so the DLC railroading those players into a heterosexual romance was upsetting for many of them. This wasn't an issue for me personally, so I can't quite relate to their experiences of having their roleplay invalidated by additional paid content, though I imagine it must be fairly frustrating especially since LGBTQ players are not typically catered to by mainstream games. There are a few additional authority points to talk about with this too. Earlier, I discussed Odyssey's extremely limited conception of what a family is, and the legacy of the Hidden Blade DLC shrinks that even further by requiring Alexios to enter into a heterosexual relationship before he can start his own family. This shows that even though family is an extremely broad concept, Odyssey still constrains its exploration of it by exclusively viewing family through a heteronormative lens, meaning it presents heterosexual families as the default. In practical terms, the game reaffirms this by only ever showing on screen a standard nuclear family with a father, mother, and children, which also normalizes heterosexual relationships as the only type of relationship that allows for family life. Alexios, for example, can only have a child with Nima, and not any of the other romance options. Heterosexuality is thus the default mode of representation for Odyssey, and also the only mode of existence that allows for a flourishing, nuclear family life that is recognizable to modern players. There are gay and bisexual characters in Odyssey, like Alexios' mother Marini, who has a girlfriend when he finds her, but this is established through a short dialogue exchange and she is never brought up or seen again, and since the best ending has Alexios' Spartan family fully reunited into their nuclear family unit, Marini's girlfriend feels more like an afterthought than anything else. There is also Alcibiades, who's bisexual, oh, 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 don't, don't mind her. She likes to watch. But he's a salacious comic relief character more than anything else. There are also two different side quests about finding a woman's missing girlfriend, but both quests end in tragedy as the girlfriend is already dead. What's worth emphasizing in regards to Odyssey's representation of non-heteronormative couples is that they are never rightly considered family. 
family as a word is only ever used by Odyssey to refer to heterosexual nuclear families, outside of Phoebe's use of it at the start of the game, but as I've already discussed, that directly leads into Alexia's daydreaming about his Spartan family, so the word is still directly connected to the nuclear family. While LGBTQ relationships exist within the game, they exist in a space outside of what Odyssey considers to be family. Because Odyssey's exploration of family is so banal, and because family is the central focus of the third and final episode of the Legacy DLC, Bloodlines, it is by far my least favorite. It's still better than the story in the base game, but that isn't saying much. The most interesting part of Bloodlines is how it emphasizes yet another interesting facet of choice-based games, that being the way the story's context can dramatically change depending on the player's choices. The final arc of the three-part DLC is that Nima is killed and her and Alexios' son is kidnapped. This allows Odyssey to ascend to the halls of prestige video games by including a sad mad murder dad arc, a very specific kind of arc that has nonetheless cropped up in a number of prestige games in recent years. However, if I had chosen to play as Cassandra at the start of the game, the DLC is actually kind of subversive because it becomes a somber sullen murder mother arc, something that other AAA studios have yet to replicate. Other than that, however, I found the Bloodlines DLC to be mostly boring. I understand and even respect the attempt to make it more personally involved than the previous two episodes, but there wasn't a whole lot to work with because Alexios isn't a terribly fleshed out character. When I said that Alexios and Cassandra feel like two different characters despite sharing the same lines of dialogue, that was both a compliment to the voice actors and also a veiled criticism of the characters. If Alexios and Cassandra were more fleshed out, swapping the main character's gender and voice actor would not feel like such a significant change. As it is, however, the main character of Odyssey is determined more by their voice than the script. I think this is down to how Odyssey can't make up its mind about whether or not it wants to fully commit to having its main character be entirely defined by the player, or if they want them to be a character the player makes choices for. This is a non-issue in the Witcher series because Geralt is a pre-established character from the books, so he already has a strong characterization for the writers to work with. That does come with additional challenges though, like making sure everything Geralt says and does is in character, and then also allowing players enough room to roleplay within his character. Odyssey wants to be like the Witcher, but Alexios winds up in an awkward middle ground where he doesn't have much character, but there also isn't enough room to define his character through roleplay. The most defined part of his character is that he wants his Spartan family back, though why he does is never explored. Does he feel lonely? Is he searching for his place in the world? Does he just want closure on his childhood trauma? Honestly, who the hell is this guy? These questions are never given concrete answers, and Alexios emotes however the story needs him to at any given moment, which leads to awkward moments like him screaming about his kidnapped son, who I have no connection to, but Alexios does from his time spent with him off screen. If Alexios was more thoroughly developed as a character, the Bloodlines DLC could potentially work, but the foundation it's working with is nothing but sand that blows wherever the wind wills it. The episode is also named Bloodlines for a very specific reason, too, outside of just being about rescuing Alexios' kidnapped son. At the very end of the DLC, Darius leaves Greece with Alexios' son, and they go to… Egypt. As soon as this happened, I realized Alexios was going to be the ancestor of either Bayek or Aya. One of the best parts of Origins was how it intentionally rejected the AC franchise's fetishization of Bloodlines, and as I already discussed, Odyssey wholeheartedly returns to Bloodline worshipping, but even so, I still didn't expect it to try and retroactively drag down Origins too. Like so much of Odyssey's story, however, the twist doesn't even make sense. For one, nothing in Origins' story or gameplay suggests Aya is a Divine's descendant. I will say it is kind of clever because Aya is half Greek, so the groundwork is kind of there. Except for the fact that Odyssey takes place around a thousand years before Origins, so that only really works if she was Alexios' child. More importantly though, the twist doesn't even matter because Aya's bloodline still dies with her, so what exactly was the point of including it? 
Odyssey repeatedly stresses how important it is for Alexios to continue his bloodline. There's even an exceptionally cruel dialogue option where you can tell Nima the only reason they're together is for the sake of the bloodline. Why then does the DLC throw in a last minute twist that runs the bloodline straight into a dead end? This is, however, one of the reasons why I want to once again stress that none of my criticisms are reflective of the writer's skill, because the circumstances in which the twist was created are undoubtedly different to how it was delivered in the end product. The storyline for the DLC might have been written at the same time as Origins was in production, meaning there could have been a time where it made perfect sense. I was not a part of that process, so it isn't fair to cast judgement on how it came about. All I have to go by is the end product, and as it is now, Bloodline's final twist is more perplexing than anything else, because it's playing a zero-sum game. To be honest, most of the flaws with the legacy of the Hidden Blade DLC are just extensions of issues from the base game, which is why I still enjoyed my time with it overall, because I had just come to accept them as part of the Odyssey experience. The boosted production values and decent use of episodic storytelling were pleasant surprises, and the new story arc was at least interesting, despite its imperfections. Even though I enjoyed the legacy of the Hidden Blade content, Odyssey's final DLC, The Fade of Atlantis, is both some of the best content in the game and long enough to actually be another game. Like the Legacy DLC, it's made up of three different episodes, except instead of taking place in Greece, each episode takes place in an entirely new mythological location. The first episode takes place in Elysium as Alexios helps a rebellion against the goddess Persephone. The second takes place in Hades and offers closure on several characters from the base game, and the final episode closes out the modern day storyline as well as Odyssey's story as a whole. Each part of the Atlantis DLC is great for a variety of different reasons, which is why I'm going to cover all of them individually. Elysium's narrative differentiates itself from every other part of Odyssey by slowly building up a sense of apprehension, and the feeling that everything you do is going to backfire at some point. The basic setup is that Alexios gets trapped in Elysium, and to escape, he works with a number of different parties, including the Queen of Elysium herself, Persephone, Persephone's advisor, Hecate, and the god of ill-advised relationships, Adam, at your service. By completing quests for all of them, Alexios is essentially playing for every team, something that is guaranteed to blow up in his face, especially since they all have such strong personalities and conflicting goals. Persephone, above all else, wants to maintain control over Elysium, and her quests all include some kind of petty cruelty, like stealing a horse away from a man she blinded, or ordering Alexios to kill his grandfather. Adonis is a simple fool, so his tasks are fairly straightforward acts of rebellion that amount to weakening Persephone's military. Hecate, on the other hand, gives Alexios seemingly simple tasks that all come with some kind of catch. Her questline comes together quite nicely as Persephone summons the both of you to explain your actions, and Hakate throws you under the chariot. I, however, decided I couldn't trust her early on, so I sabotaged every task she asked of me in one way or another, and when she started casting blame, I spun enough lies of my own to take her down too. That in turn then changed the ending to include a scene where Persephone cast a spell on Hakate that forces her to speak only the truth. It isn't a huge change, but it was enough of an acknowledgement of my choices that it nonetheless made them feel meaningful. Of course, afterwards, Alexios is next on the chopping block for defying the literal goddess of Elysium, who sends him down to Hades to be Cerberus' chew toy. And this one is mine. Outside of the boss fight against Cerberus that made me feel surprisingly guilty after the cutscene reminded me I just killed a dog, the Torment of Hades DLC was fairly underwhelming for the first few hours. The main quest for the DLC is straight up busy work that ferries Alexios from one end of the poorly lit underworld to another, because Hades tasks him with re-killing legendary Greek heroes so that they can replace Cerberus as gate guardians. And, I mean, fair enough, some chores are probably in order for becoming the god of SWAT teams and murdering his dog, but after the Elysium DLC, I was expecting a lot more than a few extra house calls. 
As it turns out, there is an abundance of quality content in Hades, it's just that all of it is optional. There are several different side quest chains that offer some much needed closure on a few important characters from the base game's story. While I can't say I particularly approve of saving character closure for additional paid content, the initial release of Odyssey is only a fraction of its lifespan, so in the long run it still rounds out the experience quite nicely. One of the real highlights is Brasidas' questline, where he is slowly forced to confront the fact that because he lived his life as a good Spartan, he was absolutely not a good person, and since I only lied to him for the sake of his self-esteem a few times instead of every time, he decided he was unworthy of ascending to the freshly trashed paradise that is Elysium, which might make Brasidas the only major character in Odyssey who genuinely reflects on his actions. Unfortunately, the framing of the entire Atlantis DLC undercuts everything that happens because it all takes place in a simulated recreation of a different person's memories, so anything Alexios experiences is basically worthless. Brasidas' entire arc is meaningless because he didn't actually have one, since it was just a simulated experience made for Alexios' benefit. The real Brasidas died as he lived, a gormless worm, and if there was anything else waiting for him after that, Alexios never gets to know. It's unfortunate that the DLC frames itself this way, doubly so because the entire context for why Alexios goes on the Atlantis adventures is entirely divorced from him. Basically, the whole reason he enters the simulation is to build up his connection to a magical staff, which he will then wait several thousand years to pass on to the present-day protagonist, Layla, who relives Alexios' memories, which also builds her connection to the staff, and she's going to use the staff to fight against the, the big bad Templars, I guess. Look, I just don't care. Some people like AC's modern-day storyline. I don't, because it's not very good. It was such a minor part of Origins, I never brought it up because there was next to nothing to talk about, other than that it introduces Layla as the new protagonist, but she has about 15 to 30 minutes of screen time maximum. Odyssey gives her a bigger role, and even though I don't like the present day story, the only way for it to do anything interesting is to have some time dedicated to it, so it is the right call. Still, to make Alexios' whole motive for going through some grueling simulations be to power up a magical staff for a person he'll know for five minutes until he drops dead is just… so self-defeating. For starters, it means there's no real overarching storyline for the Atlantis DLC. Alexios has no personal motive for any of it either, he is simply the protagonist of the game, which also makes him the protagonist of the wacky wahoo underworld adventures, but he's not connected to any of it until the absolute last part of the DLC, and even then his connection isn't real because he's a stand-in for the person who supposedly actually experienced the events the simulation is based off of. In order to enjoy the DLC, despite the fact that it sacrificed Alexios for the sake of the present day storyline, I, like the game, conveniently forgot about the simulation part of it until it was brought up again. However, I deemed it necessary to talk about now because of how it sabotages any kind of character catharsis that comes from the Hades DLC. To be honest, I don't even know why Alexios had to relive simulated memories instead of just having the events he goes through be the real deal. Before moving on to the Atlantis portion of the Fate of Atlantis DLC, I want to briefly talk about the changes made to the gameplay, because I criticized Origins for its lack thereof. Each episode of the Fate of Atlantis includes a number of changes to the core gameplay experience. For starters, exploration is much more rewarding, because you get skill points from checklisting special locations scattered across the maps. In addition, there are some powerful new active skills you can unlock too. Ironically, I basically didn't use any of them because my assassin build was already overpowered, and none of the abilities could top killing 5 enemies by pressing one hotkey 5 times, but I still hunted down every last ability because the possibility of finding something to make me even more powerful was exciting. The last episode also adds some new weapon abilities, like one that makes assassin skills do area of effect damage, so I became powerful enough to strike down 5 enemies with 1 button press instead of 5. I was actually shocked Odyssey wholeheartedly accepted it was broken and let me break it even further. 
That's not a criticism, mind you. There's no multiplayer component to Odyssey, and it isn't a game focused on delivering a specific kind of challenge, so it doesn't need to carefully balance its gameplay systems. The power fantasy at the heart of Odyssey is about being a demigod hero, so striking down scores of enemies with next to no effort is an effective way to sell that fantasy. Needless to say, the story for the Fate of Atlantis DLC feeds the power fantasy by having Alexios take on the gods themselves, like at the end of the Hades DLC where he tactically neutralizes the grumpy god before absconding with Poseidon to Atlantis proper. Up to this point, Odyssey has had three different endings. I don't mean that in the sense that there are multiple endings you can unlock based on your choices. I mean there are three different instances in which the story of Odyssey concludes in a single playthrough. The end of the Atlantis DLC marks the fourth and final ending of the game, and despite some severe issues here and there, Odyssey does end on a high note. This is due mostly to the final story arc. Atlantis is a city where gods and humans coexist, and since Alexios is a demigod, Poseidon appoints him as the Decastis, essentially a position of power with the ability to cast judgement on the whole city. For the first time in the entire game, Alexios is bestowed a position of power that reflects his actual godlike powers, yet nothing is quite as it seems in Atlantis. It's definitely one of the parts of the game with the fewest laughs, and that's because it's all laced with cynicism. The gods Alexios works for are bitter, cruel sociopaths who ask him for help with seemingly simple tasks that all include some kind of inhumane catch. The gods claim to care about humans, but all they really are to them is experiments, problems, and a mob to be entertained. They're treated like animals and carefully caroused so that the gods can maintain their power. The whole city is fundamentally broken, but there's no desire to fix any of the issues. Instead, maintaining the status quo with superficial changes is all the gods care about. There's a quest where Alexios helps a human attain godhood so that she can rule beside Atlas as an equal after he wanted to keep their relationship secret since she was a human. When she becomes a god like him, however, he violently lashes out because to him, she was a plaything, not an equal. The moment his power is challenged, he turns to violence. But because Alexios is the Decastes, he isn't subject to the will of the gods, and acts as a whirlwind of change, tearing the city apart in the process. All of the gods you encounter in the main story can die as a direct result of your actions. Though Alexios brings righteous judgement upon all the gods by the end, the work he does for them to get to that point is suspiciously similar to the kinds he did back in Greece, right down to putting down a just rebellion. This leads into the final stretch of the story in what is a brilliant moment of self-awareness where Alexios voiced every one of my complaints with the menial labor I had performed for all of the gods. He straight up calls out the boring fetch and kill quests, and expresses how unbelievably tired he is of everything. What follows is the most important choice in the game, where you dictate what Alexios' sad, self-pitying little speech is about, with hungry, horny, and sleepy as your options. For once, Alexios and I were both on the same wavelength as he whined about how he longs for sleep. I am being a bit facetious here, but I do genuinely think the moment is a highlight of the game and a great way to introduce the final ending to such an expansive experience. Alexios is tired of it all. He really no longer does what he's doing anymore and he just wants it to end. You! Bring me the biggest bird in Atlantis! You! All the pillows you can find! Tonight we sleep! For we are... Very, very tired. We're almost done, Alexios. Fortunately for him, a young boy comes along to rope him into the final stretch of the game. The boy's parents have gone missing, and so the ending starts off with a seemingly simple, catch-free task, and then ends in a spectacular fashion. By the time the judgement of Atlantis finally comes, it's clear the city is so completely corrupt there's no way to fix it. After squaring off against gods and monsters alike, Alexios' journey finally comes to a close with a tired speech and the cataclysmic destruction of Atlantis. It's a bit strange that weariness is one of the center points of Odyssey's ending, when so much of the game is dedicated to being a sprawling adventure for players to lose themselves in, but it worked for me because I too was weary of Odyssey. 
And yet, even though I was tired of it, even though I have a laundry list of issues with it, and even though it was a trying experience at times, I do love Odyssey. For how much flack Ubisoft games get for their homogeneity, Odyssey is a game that takes you through an adventure all across Greece, a sad mad murder dad arc 50 hours in, and then sends you to trash Elysium, Hades, and Atlantis. There's nothing else quite like it, even within its own franchise. I still think there are some serious issues with both the narrative and gameplay, but those issues might not even matter to you if you don't care about the story and like the simplicity of the gameplay. There are also parts of Odyssey that I don't feel qualified to talk about, like its absolutely stunning use of color, which I've tried to showcase throughout this video, though that still can't compare to actually experiencing Odyssey for yourself. It is a frankly overwhelming game, and in this video I've only covered the aspects of it I consider to be key to the experience. For me, the most defining part of Odyssey is Alexios, because in many ways, Alexios is Odyssey. Both could stand to be less of a dumbass and won't SHUT THE FUCK UP about family, but if you're willing to look past their flaws, they are both gorgeous, dumb, charismatic, and pretty fun. Thanks for listening to you! I've suffered enough! Let's get going. <laughs> I need to be oiled before I go to the games. Well, I would have been happy to assist if you were in any state to compete. I like to be oiled. Well, that's obvious. Yeah. You know us. Oh. Come here. Gives us a hug. Surely he can swim. Well, looks like you're the champion now. Huh?